The morning of the 7th of July was the same as same as you know, a million other mornings. Walk up here, book on with the with the manager, have a chat with the lads, get the the road number where the train where the train is. Then um, nice stroll down the Yale, which is about three quarters of a mile, which is a nice stroll early in the morning. It wasn't that day because it was quite drizzly. At a quarter to six, Jeff Porter picked up his Circle Line train and set off on the first circuit of the morning. At that time of the morning, there's not too many people about, there's not too many trains about, so it tends to run fairly well. And that morning, I was on time the entire time. In fact, I'm running a couple of minutes early most of the time. So my duty would have, would have had two circles before getting off for, for breakfast at Edgebear Road. Gary Stevens is a duty station manager at Russell Square. I started work at approximately half past seven. It was um, on the way in, a normal day, really. It's looking, coming in, thinking, planning me days. It was an early term. Thanks a lot. Gary's first job of the morning was dealing with a faulty Piccadilly line train. I then come upstairs, started me a uh, normal office band duties. It was a, a, a quiet morning, and. Um... So, in fact, it was boringly quiet. Celia Harrison was supervising the station at Allgate. It's just an office, it's not really a control room. That's where I was. We have two screens. We also have a, a computer with something called tracker on it, which indicates which trains are where, what the train numbers are, um, so we can see how far away our next train is and can match up the drivers with the correct trains. Ellen Brush was on her way to a meeting. She'd boarded a crowded train at Finsbury Park. But it was incredibly busy um, and I got down onto the Piccadilly line station just as the train was coming in and in fact I was going to get on the second carriage but I don't know for some reason even though it was really busy in all the carriages I decided to fight my way down the back and ended up getting I think in the second or third carriage from the back and I was reading about how London had just got the Olympics the day before, you know, so I'm standing there reading. During the morning rush hour, London Underground operates over 500 trains on 12 lines. Any problems on the system are reported to the network control centre where the response is coordinated. Darren McCluskey was the manager on duty that morning. Reasonably normal morning, you know, the normal line was suspended. On top of that, we had a defective train on the Piccadilly line at Caledonia Road on the eastbound. While that incident was going on, we had another train on the Bakerloo line at, oh, I can't remember now, Piccadilly Circus that became defective. So all this was all going on at the same time. Anything that stops a train running 
we get caught up. Anything that stops London, basically, isn't yeah. it? Any, anything, anything in London where that was just... Nobody knows we exist, I don't think, except for people on the underground and tube lines. No, gen gen general public, no, I don't think the general public don't, general don't know. The don't know. They don't even they know, know, know. The Emergency Response Unit, or ERU, is the underground's dedicated team of emergency engineers. They specialize in moving and securing damaged trains and equipment. Joe Walsh is the ERU team leader at Acton. Well, on the day of the 7-7, we was uh, on a training course uh, here in this building here. The ERU regularly instruct the emergency services in specific techniques for rescuing people caught under trains or in tunnels. We're going to move them down a couple of feet so the dock's going to then get in the space between the, uh, the platform. We train the fire brigade, the ambulance, the police. So they, they used to confine spaces for one because that's a, that's a big thing on the railways, confined spaces. Darkness is another thing. You can't literally move under there, do you know what I mean? Which is another thing. Good effort. Thank you, Hems. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll yeah, see you next, uh, later on this week, yeah? Right then. Uh, see you later. Yeah, Ta-da. Pull it through the block. It's quite a long time. I mean, I've been on the train since probably about half past five when I've actually jumped on it and started to prepare it till this is, this is ten, to, ten to nine, so that's quite a, a little a pe period of time. So, I mean, my, my thoughts were totally focused on breakfast. I mean, that was the whole, you know, my whole world. <laughs> The train left King's Cross and I can remember thinking, oh, thank God, it's only two more stops until Holborn and I can change. And I always remember, also remember thinking, it's incredibly crowded today. If something was to happen, it'd be awful. Between Paddington and Edgware Road, the Circle Line intersects two other lines at Prade Street Junction. Well, as I was coming up to Parade Street Junction, I could see that all the platforms at Edgeware Road in front of me were, were full. As I say, it was probably a minute or two early. So there were two district line trains in the, mid, in the two middle platforms, and there was a, uh, an eastbound train in, in platform one. So as I was coming up to the signal that protects the platforms, I was, I was slowing down for it and uh, getting ready to stop. And I saw an inner rail circle line train leaving from platform four on uh, Edgeware Road. You can actually see the platform, but I saw it come around the corner. Thinking, but I think that it, it didn't. It didn't seem quite not quite right as it was. As it was but I couldn't couldn't say what it was. There was a bright yellow light on the train, and then uh, then there was just smoke and dust and the noise of. It sounded like somebody had dropped a scrapyard on the track. The train just came to this like amazing halt. It's kind of a muffled woomph and everything shook. And it was just a moment of quietness, just a moment, um, and then it vanished. At Aldgate, Celia Harrison was one of the first people above ground to know that anything was wrong. But all the power went. We heard the explosion. We didn't know what it was at the time. And um, in fact, Steve, my um, station assistant, rushed into the room and, and said, what on earth was that? And we sort of all rushed out to see what we could see. We could see smoke beginning to come out, but we couldn't see what had gone on. We didn't know that there was even a train there. Celia called the line manager to report the power failure. This was the first indication Darren McCluskey at the Network Control Centre had that anything was wrong. 8.50, that's when we got the first calls relating to um, an explosion or a loss of traction current at Allgate. We've lost traction current, nothing more, nothing less. We, we know we've lost traction current, we don't know why we've lost current. Reports of loud explosion, fine, but an 11 kV HC ca cable will, when it ratures, will make that sort of noise. So it's all consistent at the moment. It's consistent with a power surge or a power problem. 
The power supply problems were not confined to Aldgate. I had a call at 8.54 from the Northern Line telling me that they'd, lost, they'd had a power surge and lost current as well. Around 8.56, this message went out that there was a major power failure had occurred and it affected a large area of the underground. At about the same time, Gary Stevens was on duty at Russell Square when a group of passengers reported a loud noise from the westbound tunnel. The customers indicated that this is where the bang had come from. Um, myself and Dave Boyce, we walked down to here. We was looking at the rails to see if there was anything untoward. We couldn't see any indication of anything that was wrong. Gary and Dave then noticed lights in the tunnel coming towards them from the direction of King's Cross. It took about five to six minutes before the driver and the injured parties got to us. It was then we realised something, something had gone wrong big time. The driver had led out as many of the passengers as he could from the front of the train. He didn't say it was a bomb, he just said that uh, something terrible's happened. I'm, I'm not sure what, but something terrible's happened. There's people down there, they need help. I then jumped down and um, made my way to the affected train. Once we got to the train, I instantly realised that something terribly had gone wrong. And um, right in front of me, there was a young lad who'd had his leg blown off.